Well, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, so thank you for joining this webinar on working with local opioid coalitions. My name is Chelsea Kelleher, and I work for Herrera Health Group, and we are helping the Department of Healthcare Services facilitate today's webinar. Today's webinar will be presented by the California Overdose Prevention Network, or COPEN, which is a project of the Public Health Center for Health Leadership and Impact. They are experts in the field of community coalition building and will provide information about working with your local opioid coalition. On today's webinar from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m., COPEN will be discussing California's opioid coalitions and provide examples of their work. Uh, the first part of the webinar will conclude at that time, and then from 1.30 to 2 p.m., you're welcome to stay on for an additional presentation from COPEN about a needs assessment tool that they have developed that can help guide your work in your jurisdiction. Next slide, please. Um, for today's housekeeping items, if you have a technical question, please send a direct message to Audrey Richardson from Aurora Health Group. Questions can be submitted at any time via the question box in the right-hand corner of your control panel. And today's meeting materials will be available during the meeting. They are on the handouts tab on your GoToWebinar control panel, and they will also be available after the webinar. They will be posted to the DHCS website. Tomorrow, you'll be able to add, access both the slides and the recording from today's presentation. Next slide, please. For asking questions today, please type your comments into the questions box located on your GoToWebinar control panel. Today's webinar will provide an opportunity for a Q&A about the topics that we're discussing today. And for today's discussion, those will be about opioid coalitions and local planning. We would ask that if you have specific questions about your specific plan for spending opioid settlement funds, that you address those technical assistance questions to osf at dhcs.ca.gov. Next slide, please. Just a reminder that past webinars and listening sessions can be accessed on the DHCS OSF webpage. You can view all of our past webinars there. Next slide. And additional resources regarding allowable expenditures, frequently asked questions, and a technical assistance form can all also be accessed on the DHCS website. Um, all right, next slide, please. With that, I want to turn it over to Amy Max from the Public Health Institute Center for Health Leadership and Impact, and she is going to walk us through how to engage with local opioid coalitions. Amy is a senior program manager at the center, and the California Overdose Prevention Network is a project of the Public Health Center for Health Leadership and Impact. So I'll leave it to Amy to take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Really appreciate it. And thank you to the Department of Healthcare Services, DHCS, for inviting us to speak today. Uh, we are super excited to have this opportunity to talk with you about the work of local opioid safety coalitions and how they can play an instrumental role in helping you strategize the use of your opioid settlement funds. We are also excited to present a tool that we developed to help you build a cohesive strategy to maximize the impact of your settlement funds and even get a potential return on investment which could support your local budgets. We know that these funds represent a groundbreaking opportunity to focus on opioid remediation and save as many lives as possible. Given the tremendous losses we've all experienced and continue to experience in our communities, we wanna help you use these funds as effectively and as efficiently as possible. So we'll have this first hour of presentation to go through some strategies and ideas and introduce the work of local opioid safety coalitions and as Chelsea said, if you stay on for that uh, final half hour, um, we will have a discussion with you all um, to start looking through the tool that we developed to support you in your work. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right, great. So uh, I will get started with going through our learning objectives for today. Uh, first, we'll provide an overview of California's statewide infrastructure for substance use disorder and overdose prevention that align with the high impact abatement activities and other core strategies and approved uses you have for spending your opioid settlement funds. Then we'll highlight the critical role that local coalitions can play in supporting you in building a cohesive local strategy. And then at the end, we'll introduce a tool that you can use to begin building that strategy focused on high impact interventions. Uh, but first, we have a couple poll questions we'd like to ask everyone in the audience to get started. 
So to start us off, we're interested to find out how many of you have already engaged your local overdose prevention coalition in your process around the opioid settlement funds. So we will launch that poll and give you a second. And we have either yes or no here, but you can also put um, anything into the Q&A box, uh, the question box, if there's um, something other than yes or no that you'd like to share with us around these questions. Okay, we'll give folks a little more time to answer this. Great. Okay, I think we can close that up. Super interesting. Okay, so it looks like about two or one third of you all have engaged your local coalition and two thirds of you have not. So perfect. Well, it'll be a great conversation today for those of you and who have not, maybe can learn a little bit more about the coalitions. And then for those who have to be able to um, hopefully share your experiences in doing that. It's great to see. Okay, so next question. So we recognize that each participating subdivision may be in a different phase in determining how your funds will be allocated. Uh, some of you are developing a strategy, which is something we strongly encourage and we'll talk about in this presentation. Um, and we also know that many of you may not feel equipped or well positioned to develop a strategy, which is why we'll talk about the role that your coalition can play in helping you support this process um, and to provide you with a tool that you can also use to start building a strategy. So to get a sense of where people are, um, let's use this next poll question, which is, have you started a local planning process to develop a strategy around your opioid settlement funds? So we've got, yes, we've started a process, we're developing a strategy. B, yes, we've started a process, and then in fact, we already have a strategy in place, you're kind of green light, good to go. C, you don't have one, but you are planning on developing a strategy. And no, you don't have any plans to develop a strategy at this point, that would be D. A little time for folks to answer always feel like a game show host when we do these polls on webinars. It's very fun. Okay, I think the, the responses have kind of settled in. So we can close that up. Great, super interesting distribution. So 27% um, have uh, started their process. Um, only 7% already have a strategy in place. I'm really glad we're having this conversation today. Um, and more than half of you, um, the bulk, um, want to uh, plan to develop a strategy, but haven't started that process. And then we've got 12% who don't plan on developing a strategy. So interesting distribution there, super helpful for us to know where everyone lands in this. So thank you. And then our third and final poll question, we want to know if any of you have already begun spending your initial allotment of opioid settlement funds. We know that it's going to be an annual process and there'll be um, additional funds that will come in from other litigation. So have you begun spending your money, your opioid settlement funds? So let's launch that. And A is no, you've not spent any funds to date. B is yes, you've already spent some of the funds you've received. And C is yes, you've spent all of the funds. here. Okay, looks like things are pretty settled here as well. So great, super helpful. 93% um, have not spent any funds yet. So this is a perfect juncture in this process to, to have this conversation. Um, and 8% have spent some of the funds um, and no one has responded that they spent all of them. So great, super helpful to know what's happening across the state. Thank you. All right, so let's go on to our agenda. We'll start with the landscape of SUD or substance use disorder program so you can really understand what's already happening in your community that you can plug into in creating a strategy. Um, then we'll talk about the coalitions and the role they can play and then we'll dive into that tool. So 
next slide, as we talk about and talk through the various programs that already exist in your community, including the role of coalitions, we want to start with this framework that was developed um, by the John Hopkins School of Public Health that has five guiding principles to help jurisdictions like yours in using opioid litigation funds. And these principles really address the key points that we want to emphasize and need to take home from today, which is that these funds are earmarked for opioid work and, and not things like potholes. Um, there are fixing potholes. There are multiple areas of unmet need which continue to drive the crisis in all of our communities. That every community needs a hub for coordination across sectors, which could be a local coalition. Um, and there are partners working in this space who know the needs. And so engaging those partners in your community and coalitions is a really efficient way to gain visibility locally and tied to the overdose prevention infrastructure that you already have. So we definitely encourage you to review this framework. It really lays out the key considerations and I'm gonna go through it um, a bit here. And the first is to spend the money to save lives. So given the economic downturn, many states and localities might be tempted to use their opioid settlement dollars to fill in holes in their budgets rather than expand needed programs. Um, and jurisdictions should really use these funds to supplement rather than replace existing spending. So despite gaps in local budgets, they need to be used to ameliorate this really, really deep crisis, deep-rooted crisis that we have um, in all of our communities. And it's important to know that current are already unable to meet the needs of people who use drugs. So for example, only 10 to 20% of those with an opioid use disorder are receiving any treatment at all, only 10 to 20%. So there's a real unmet need that you can help fill. So as a jurisdiction, you can help adopt this first principle by establishing a dedicated fund to ensure that the money is going where it needs to be instead of being used to replace any existing investments in overdose prevention. And you can outline acceptable uses of the dollars when establishing the fund. So again, some of your coalitions, or sorry, some of your jurisdictions have already developed comprehensive plans um, and that can be used as a starting point. And again, we'll provide some support through this tool to help you develop a plan um, that you can use to make sure that you spend the money that will save lives. The second principle is to use evidence to guide your spending. So at this point in the epidemic, there is a substantial body of evidence demonstrating what works. And jurisdictions should really use this information to inform your funding decisions. So for example, some residential treatment facilities prohibit medications for addiction like methadone or buprenorphine, despite clear evidence that these treatments reduce the chance of overdose death by 50% or more, which is pretty extraordinary. So as a jurisdiction, you can help address this gap by using dollars to support evidence-based programs and programs that help support the full range of medications we know work for addiction. Jurisdictions should fund initiatives demonstrated by research to work, and that also includes, in addition to addiction treatment, things like youth prevention programs, harm reduction programs, and communication campaigns that address stigma. The third principle is to invest in youth prevention. We know this is a really uh, important topic uh, for many people across the state and across the country because programs that support children and youth and families are long-term effective investments. Overdose rates among adolescents continue to climb. And so any comprehensive effort to reduce the toll of substance use generally and opioids specifically must invest in youth primary prevention programs. So these are designed to help stop use and addiction before it starts. It can interrupt the pathway to addiction and overdose. And these programs can really also lower the risk of not only substance use, but other negative outcomes like unemployment and poverty. Um, and they're also shown with research to have a favorable return on investment. So there's been some studies that even show that you can get an $18 return for every dollar spent on youth prevention programs. So again, important to focus on ones that are evidence-based, but a real key area um, and principle of opportunity in terms of your, your spending principle is to focus on racial equity. So this is a key area of focus that local coalitions across California are really working on. And localities should direct significant funds to communities affected by years of discriminatory policies, and they're now experiencing substantial increase in increases in overdose rates. So although communities of color experience substance use disorders at similar rates as other racial groups, 
the rates of overdose deaths has really skyrocketed <clears throat> more rapidly, <clears throat> excuse me, in black and indigenous communities than in white communities. And we know that historically racist policies and practices associated with our war on drugs have led to differential impact in the epidemic. The communities of color are more likely to face barriers in accessing treatment. And while black individuals represent just 5% of people who use drugs, they're 29% of those arrested for drug offenses and 33% of those in state um, prison for drug offenses. So as a jurisdiction, you can invest your funding in communities affected by these policies and support programs and communities of color that tackle the root cause of addiction. You can also support diversion programs that link participants to community-based services and treatment rather than incarceration and fund community-based harm reduction programs that meet the needs of people who use drugs. You can also fund anti-stigma uh, campaigns given the tremendous stigma that communities of color face and involve community members in the solution. So again, coalitions are really key and instrumental in working on these policies and programs around racial equity and can be a key partner with this um, uh, uh, guiding principle. And then the fifth one is to develop a fair and transparent process for deciding where to spend your funding. So we'll talk about this more with the tool we developed for you all, but there should be an organized process you have that's guided by public health leaders and engages people and families with lived experience who really represent the diversity of those most affected by this crisis. It should use data in your strategy to identify areas where funds can make the biggest difference and then give real decision-making power to community leaders most impacted by the epidemic. So again, we think these five principles give a really great foundation for you as a local jurisdiction to consider, and we'll provide support through this tool and how you can put these into practice. Next slide. So now that we've talked about the overarching principles, let's talk about what's happening in your communities that you can plug into to make them happen. This is a graphic that was developed a couple of years ago, but it gives a great visual representation of the breadth of existing programs that are happening across California in each of your communities. The yellow boxes represent programs that the California Department of Healthcare Services, DHCS, originally invested in during their initial work to truly expand access to MAT or medication assisted treatment in California. And again, MAT is an evidence-based approach that's shown to reduce overdose rates by up to, up to 50%. So the state has invested heavily in getting more people with substance use disorder on treatments, including buprenorphine or suboxone and methadone. And we show you this chart to give you a sense of the landscape of existing programs you can plug into as you develop your funding strategy. So instead of starting from scratch, the tool we'll show you later has an inventory in the addendum of all of the current projects that you could connect with, with links of how to get started and who to connect with. So for example, um, in the, at the county level, which you'll see in that top left corner of the diagram, there are programs to increase access to addiction treatment in jails across California and through the Medi-Cal organized delivery system. The lower left depicts the different projects and programs in California that are focused on inpatient and outpatient substance use disorder services, like those in support of housing and youth recovery programs. The lower uh, right depicts clinical programs, like the California Bridge Program, that provides addiction treatment in emergency departments across California through the use of substance use navigators and programs that expand access to treatment in primary care clinics as well. And the top right shows several prevention programs. So this includes things like prevention programs with youth and also the naloxone distribution program to make sure all organizations in California can apply to get free naloxone or Narcan to make sure it's widely available to reverse overdoses wherever they happen. Just like we have AED machines everywhere if someone has a heart attack within a community. And then finally, at the center, we have statewide programs, which includes my team's California Overdose Prevention Network, or COPEN, that supports the work of local coalitions that are embedded in California communities and help organize and facilitate a wide range of prevention, treatment, and harm reduction work. So I know this is a busy graphic, but it's really meant to give you a sense of the wide range of existing evidence-based work that's already taking place in your community that you can connect to and support through opioid settlement funds. Next slide. 
So to summarize some key points so far, what we really want to emphasize are the following ways to maximize your impact. Number one, develop a strategy. Uh, we know you might not feel equipped or have the bandwidth to do this, especially if you represent a local county council, but instead you can enlist local partners like your coalition or public health department, and they can help you create that strategy. And having a strategy is so important and key to making sure you take advantage of this pivotal opportunity to make a real difference with the funds. So take the time to engage your local leaders, build that strategy and invest in evidence-based programs. Number two is to support existing programs instead of reinventing the wheel. So there are programs in your community that have shown to be effective and can increase their reach and impact through additional funding. They can also support a return on investment for your local budget, like some of the um, projects I was mentioning earlier that have been shown to have an ROI. And finally, number three is to align your funding streams. So you could create a dedicated fund and build efficiencies by blending and braiding these funds with other funds within your community focused on substance use prevention and treatment. Next slide. So let's talk a bit now about the work of local coalitions and how they can support you in building and executing a strong investment strategy for your settlement funds. Community coalitions across California are building unprecedented partnerships across sectors to address the overdose crisis. Each coalition in California looks a bit different. Some were started by local medical societies, others by government agencies like public health departments, and others got started by local advocates like a mother who lost her son to an accidental overdose. No matter how it formed, each coalition is comprised of dedicated people who commit their time, usually unpaid, to work with others in their community to implement evidence-based projects and programs that reflect the current drug supply and climate. They also define unique approaches to local issues because they re represent the communities they serve. So they're all able to mobilize assets, change local culture by addressing stigma, and understand how to make policy relevant in the local environment. On the left of the slide, you can see the core areas of work that coalitions work on which includes strategies to prevent new addictions, manage pain safely, treat addiction, and stop overdose deaths through harm reduction. And the wheel on the right demonstrates the constellation of local partners that can comprise a coalition. So it's all about bringing different stakeholders together that have a role to play, including clinicians, first responders, law enforcement, educators, public health professionals, and more. Coalitions are effective because they take this all hands on deck approach to one of the most complex health crises of our lifetime. Next slide. So coalitions are really the cornerstone of overdose prevention activities within communities. And they're the local leaders who know what programs are happening and can help drive what's needed next. This model works because they don't just focus on one-off projects, but rather systems level change. And this diagram shows the intersection of this approach. So the green circle on the left represents the work of coalition building to bring the necessary partners within a community together at the same table to work on local solutions. And without this coalition building, we can't sustain the important interventions and strategies that you see there in the blue circle that happen in each of our communities. And we can't adapt to a changing drug, drug environment as we've seen with the rise of fentanyl, um, and now is xylosine. So those two concentric circles are incredibly important to work together for systems change. And then wrapped around the coalition building and strategy implementation that you see in the middle are the core areas of coalition work, which are communicating for impact with the local community and getting the message out there, measurement to make sure data is a centerpiece of effective decision making within a community, and sustainability planning to make sure effective programs continue to adapt and exist at the local level. Next slide. So California has the largest network of local coalitions in the country with 40 coalitions and county that reach 85% of Californians. My team at the California Overdose Prevention Network or COPEN operates a statewide learning network to support these coalitions. And for the past five years, we've built a platform for coalitions to share ideas with one another so that they can learn the latest strategies. And we also provide coaching tools, workshops, and conferences to help them accelerate their impact. 
And these coalitions lead critical work, but they also need ongoing funding. They're led by volunteers and in-kind support of dedicated stakeholders within each county, but they typically do not have a, a core set of operational funds. And those that did have grant support through the California Department of Public Health are in need of new financial support since that grant is going to sunset in August of this year, so just two months from now. So in addition to encouraging you to engage your coalition in your planning process, we also encourage you to consider allocating some of your opioid settlement funds to make sure that your local coalition can continue to exist and lead the life-saving work they're doing in your community. And you can go to copen.org to find a map of the coalition in your community uh, or reach out to our team at copen at healthleadership.org and we will happily facilitate an introduction. And also in the tool we'll introduce later, we have a link um, for where you can find the contact information for your local coalition. Next slide. So we'll hear from some local coalition leaders in just a second, but here are some specific examples of how they're making an impact. They play a key role within counties in increasing access to addiction treatment, which we've talked about, advocating for policy change, raising public awareness around things like the harms of fentanyl, increasing access to naloxone or Narcan, reaching youth through education and local campaigns, partnering with law enforcement to divert people into treatment, and focusing on racial equity uh, to reduce and reverse the harms of the war on drugs. So uh, I, in the chat, I think the organizers have a link. And if you're curious to see some more examples of coalition impact and the implications um, around the sunset of their current funding, you can take a look at that link to see more. Next slide. And then the other key piece of evidence to really hit home on how important and impactful coalitions are, is the study and evaluation that looked at counties in California with and without a coalition and found that those with a coalition saw a 21% reduction in fatal overdoses compared to counties without a coalition. So this really hits home at a population level and looking at the real impact and difference that coalitions make in California. And then I'll just share a couple exciting examples of recent work our coalitions have done um, for example, the coalition in Butte Glen recently distributed over 24,000 fentanyl test strips to help people recognize when fentanyl was in their drug supply. The Santa Cruz coalition distributed 550 Narcan kits during a drive through event. And the coalition in Watsonville has done incredible work lately partnering directly with youth to implement new policies within their school district. In the next slide, the Mendocino Coalition has a policy that they helped put in place that all first responders can carry naloxone. And in Santa Barbara, they launched a free online mail order system so that anyone can access naloxone. And so far, 430 Narcan kits have been ordered and at least seven overdose reversals reported. So it's really, really important, impactful work that they're all doing. Now, the next slide, I'd like to move to the second part of our presentation, which will be a conversation so you can hear directly from coalition leaders in California. Uh, we'll hear from two leaders about the impact the coalition has made and how they're currently involved in the local process for opioid settlement funding in their jurisdiction. And to lead that conversation, um, on the next slide, you'll see Dr. Mary Maddox-Gonzalez. She is our impact coach for COPEN. So she provides support to coalitions statewide. She is the former public health officer for Sonoma County and the former chief medical officer of the Redwood Community Health Coalition, where she helped run the Opioid Safety Coalition there. So go for it, Mary. Great. Thank you very much, Amy. And it's it's a pleasure to be here. I feel like I'm back in the in Sonoma County with with uh, local government colleagues. I was very fortunate. Most of my uh, career has been in local government. Um, in Sonoma County, working as a family physician in community health centers, uh, it, as well as the public health clinics in the hospital, it was a county hospital at the time, and then really culminating with 11 years as the public health officer and the public health division director uh, in Sonoma County. And during that time, you know, there was uh, just really had uh, very fortunate to work with excellent county councils and other departments. And the importance of coalitions of collaborative work in addressing complex issues was so important. Um, it, the importance was was just critical. Uh, and uh, definitely, as Amy said, 
addiction, the issues around opioid use disorder, prevention of addiction, uh, preventing overdoses is a complex issue. And this is, requires bringing together partners from all different sectors. No single entity can do this. And we have this tremendous opportunity now with the opioid settlement funds to really um, augment this, this work that's being done locally and impact a tremendous impact on our communities. Um, after being health officer, I was the uh, chief medical officer, uh, as Amy said, of the Redwood Community Health Coalition. That's a coalition of all the health centers in Sonoma, Napa, Marin, and Yolo counties, about 250,000 uh, patients in that area. And we saw a very significant issue with overprescribing of, of opioids, with issues of overdoses, with new addictions. And so if, about six years ago, we uh, I was lucky to co-chair the uh, Sonoma County uh, with the public health officer at the time in, in, in Sonoma County, a coalition there for opioid safety, and then joined uh, the Public Health Institute and the California Overdose Prevention Network, where I work currently as an impact coach. So you saw that map of the, the state of California. Uh, I have the privilege of working with those all those coalitions that uh, cover 86 percent of our state right now and it is a tremendously um, innovative dedicated group of coalitions that are out there uh, and as we look at you know some of the uh, what's coming out about the uh, opioid settlement funds about the um, the allowed uses of the of the settlement funds you look at exhibit e you look at the johns hopkins framework this is what these coalitions have been doing they have been working and uh, really with uh, those particularly who are part of our, our california overdose prevention network looking at how a framework for doing this where you are addressing preventing new 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 addictions addressing with with evidence-based addiction treatment. And this is something that's important. I know, um, you know, in medicine, this is something that's very exciting. We didn't used to have effective medication, and we do now. So really expanding that, um, making sure that we also are managing pain safely, and very importantly, preventing these, these uh, increasing number of overdoses in our state. So the it's i think for you know very importantly if when i was health officer i, I was involved also the, the tobacco settlement we, we this is much better structure to address the issue for which this funding is dedicated and these coalitions are really i think of them as the hub this is the hub where you see that uh, groups, the, the partners are brought together that are needed to address these multiple aspects of the complex issue around opioid uh, addiction and preventing addiction and preventing overdose, very importantly, and they have the right partners there. They're using evidence-based strategies, and they just, if you look at Exhibit E and you look at what these uh, coalitions are doing, they're aligned um, uh, hand in glove. So uh, if you don't already know that who's in your coalition, what coalitions there are in your county, uh, the map was there. You can contact COPEN, um, and this is a real resource. And then, of course, we're going to have the tool in a little bit. If you don't uh, uh, have a, a coalition yet, it gives you some ideas about how to get engaged in that. But very importantly, most counties do have this. You don't have to start from scratch. And we are very fortunate today to have two representatives from two very active coalitions in the state of California. We're going to be hearing from King Tangerman, who is the Deputy Director of Public Health in Lake County. And she has been key in the establishment and the uh, work of the Lake County SafeRx Coalition. And we also have with us Lindsay Cote, who is the Vice President of Strategic Operations for the Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society and has been critical and key to the Safety Sacramento County Opioid Coalition. And we're very fortunate to have hear from both of them. They're going to be talking to, with you today about you know, how their coalitions have impacted their community what their involvement has been in the opioid settlement funds locally, and their perspective on the value that they bring to uh, the, the work that's being done for the opioid settlements and how important it is to be engaged with the coalitions and how you can go about doing that. So I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, welcome Kim. Uh, Kim, why don't we start off with you? Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. 
And can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you, your, the impacts that your coalition has had, you know, your involvement in the coalition, of course, and the impact it's had on your community? Sure. So um, Safe Rx Lake County is um, about 10 years old. Um, it's a, a coalition that came together um, out of necessity. Um, some of our biggest impacts, um, I, I need to back up. So what we've done over these past 10 years is truly um, focused on building the trust of the coalition members. And with that, um, with that trust, there has been um, an immense amount of work that has been able to be done. Um, what we did is, I think probably the, right out of the gate, the first thing that we did is we wrote and implemented and supported the prescribing guidelines um, really early on. And that was really um, that win for all of the agencies involved, including public health, the two hospital systems, um, other providers in town, as well as um, the community really, really solidified us as a coalition that, you know, look at, look at what we can do and make a big difference so quickly. Um, so that was, that was probably the first one. Um, we've delivered, um, we've distributed thousands of kits of Narcan um, throughout any event we can get a table at, as well as through the school districts. Um, and we've also implemented a Leave It Behind program, which was really uh, super great for the EMT officers and CAL FIRE um, through, for the early the first responders to have that Narcan in their kits. Um, and what they were able to do then is in a, in a risky situation, they were actually able to leave a kit behind for, um, for a future uh, episode that may have, may take place. So that was, um, that was really super good. The other thing is we've, um, we've assisted writing policy for um, our local lo uh, Lake County Office of Education um, that was, we were able to get that passed and, um, have Narcan in the school systems and in all the school systems um, throughout Lake County. So that's another uh, another big win. Definitely, yeah, very active in in in, uh, in Lake County, and um, I know also you've shared a lot of those uh, the experiences in Lake County when we have these calls where all the coalitions get together. That's one great thing also that there's so much sharing of uh, the resources that are developed and these strategies, the incredible work that EMS is doing, you know, with leaving Narcan behind, law enforcement's doing something similar. And even now, some uh, EM, uh, EMS are beginning treatment in the field, even. So just this opportunity to share and expand has been a wonderful uh, part of these co the coalitions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement in the, in the settlement in, in uh, discussions in your, uh, in your county, in Lake County? Sure. So through, through SafeRx, we... Um, in, in a couple of the first meetings when we did, when we found out that we would be receiving these funds, we created an advisory board um, of members of the coalition and we peeled off and then started um, meeting and, and really taking a look at what it could be like with these with these funds. Um, the first thing right out of the gate through the coalition, it was agreed that some of the funds really should go to, um, the renovation and the expansion of a Clear Lake, our Clear Lake um, Behavioral Health SUD facility, it was um, in need of some work, and so that was that was an easy, an easy decision for us to make to really expand that facility, so um, there was a better access to care on that side of the lake. And so um, after that, when as we got together, um, because of the the optics on this and the spending, there's a lot of um, a lot of eyes on how this is going to be handled. And so we really wanted to do the right thing. We wanted to do due diligence and not just, you know, decide independently on how this was going to go down. So what we've done is um, we're in the midst right now of um, bringing in, at, contracting with an impartial facilitator. And what, what that person will do is come in and work with us, um, glean information from the community, um, keeping equity in mind, um, and the diverse um, population that Lake County has, and then we'll all bring that back together, and that will help us guide our decisions on the spending of the uh, the short term, the mid term, and the long term goals, and how that looks, how that looks, and how how we'll um, then allocate funds towards that, and then we'll present that back to the board of supervisors um, for you know their seal of approval, and and we'll we'll push on from there. 
That's great. And, and you know, I, I, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, too, that, you know, this strategic planning and kind of developing of an action plan, bringing in this transparent process, all of that is important for the current settlement funds. And we know there will likely be additional settlement funds. So you're really creating a, 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 a process, a, a, a way to deal with the, this and really, and most importantly, maximize the impact of this funding to improve the health of the community. That's great. Absolutely. Wonderful. And and I think we all know too that by having by building the roadmap right now, uh, not that things can't meander and change, but personnel um, has been a, a thing. And so for for four of four or five of us to to get together and put on our you know mind meld and, and come up with a great plan just didn't seem like there was any sustainability there because you don't know who's gonna even be here five years from now. And if this is gonna go on and on, you really want to have um, something that you can like that that people can inherit and take over you know as as other people leave and come and go that's wonderful thank you well you've kind of touched upon it but where do you see the value based on your uh, experience with the coalitions and this interaction uh you know where counties uh you know it's counties and cities county councils are engaged in this health departments behavioral health uh, how do you see the, the the role of coalitions and the value that they bring to this process? So I cannot imagine doing this work without the coalition. The coalition has been um, around for a while and we have built um, such an amazing amount of trust in that coalition. All of us guided kind of by um, by the work, but also um, each agency might might have funding for something and another coalition doesn't, but they can partner with them for a different reason. They can use data from another com uh, another co um, agency for, for future funding. Um, so uh, everything comes and goes through the SafeRx coalition meetings. It's all on the agenda. Um, things are decided there. Things um, agent the um, advisory committee was chosen there, and the board of supervisors looks. Um, to that as well. We've got everyone on there, really. I mean, I had to write it down because I see these people all the time, and so I know who to call, but I was like, so we have tribal rep representation, we have both hospital systems, there's no, no, nonprofits that attend, behavioral health, public health, probation, education, the Board of Supervisors, and the one thing that we're probably the weakest on, which we're not proud of, is the community input, uh, someone with lived experience. That's That seat tends to go, um, a little unfilled and then we'll get someone and then a little unfilled again. Um, so that's probably our weakest link. Um, but then again, when we're bringing in this impartial facilitator, we're really looking to get community input on um, from that meeting as well. So coalition to me is, um, it's been the, the, be the biggest and the best thing. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kim. Really appreciate your perspective. And if you'll stay with us, uh, we may have some question and the answer uh, period in just a minute. So thank you. Um, thank, I'd you. Like, thank you. I'd like to at this point introduce Lindsay Cote, uh, who I mentioned is Vice President of, of uh, Strategic Operations for Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society. And very importantly, uh, I think you're co-chair of the, the uh, Sacramento County Opioid Coalition. Um, uh, what is your perspective on some of these same issues, Lindsay? We'd love to hear from you. Sure. So um, I just want to walk through a little bit of the, the history of our coalition. We actually started in 2015 uh, through the county public health department. Um, but the county actually decided that maybe they shouldn't be running the coalition and that really it should be a community project. So in 2017, they asked uh, the medical society um, whom I work for, to take over running the coalition, and we were the um, entity that received grants for it. And at the time, um, you know, prescription medications, like you mentioned, were uh, at the forefront of the epidemic, and it made sense for a medical society representing 6,500 doctors to really take over the coalition. Um, so today, our coalition actually has 400 members, and they represent multiple organizations, including all different types of healthcare entities, law enforcement, governmental agencies, first responders, schools, faith-based organizations, um, advocates, and those suffering from substance use disorders. And we actually facilitate uh, four community meetings every year and collaborate between all of the entities that we work with. 
Um, we have four main goals with our coalition. Um, the first one is to keep patients opioid naive. Uh, next is increasing medication-assisted treatment, promoting harm reduction, and finally, we do craft a ton of public service announcements. And now, all of our new projects that support these goals are actually created with a health equity lens. So, um, in keeping patients opioid naive, just as an example, we provided multiple opportunities for primary care and pain management physicians to receive continuing medical education credits on alternative methods to pain management. Uh, we did a ton of campaigns behind that. We hung uh, posters in pharmacies and primary care doctor's offices. Uh, promoting complementary methods to pain management, and that also included a business directory um, for those services. Uh, increased medication-assisted treatment. Um, when X waivers were, were required, we did the eight-hour training. Uh, we worked with our local emergency departments on the bridge program. Uh, last year, we did uh, a MAP program specifically for pregnant patients. Um, included a bunch of different stuff with that. Um, uh, promoting harm reduction, um, we've done a ton on harm reduction. That's really um, a, a lot of what we focus on. Um, and that included you know, providing uh, training on Narcan and making sure that it was stopped in every police department uh, in Sacramento County. Um, we um, actually are putting together Narcan kits now that include detailed instructions and fentanyl test strips for those who are using drugs. And we actually train every single person that we hand a Narcan kit to. We don't just give it away. They have to receive a training. And um, we've done over 80 community presentations and handed out about 2,000 kits uh, since the middle of 2022. And we're working with other entities to do presentations in schools as well and handing out Narcan kits when we're allowed to, which isn't always the case, but we try. Um, and then I mentioned we do public service announcements. We've done uh, three major PSA campaigns in the last four years. Um, our biggest campaign right now is our Gone Too Soon campaign, where we're doing um, posters of local people who have overdosed. And we have 20, uh, 20 plus families now that are participating. And really it's to uh, take all the statistics that we all talk about and show that these are actually people uh, with very backgrounds, with names and faces and stories and families who love them, and their futures were cut short. And we actually loaned these posters out to multiple entities in our county, and they're displayed at multiple events throughout the Sacramento region. And I, we have three different versions of the posters out now that are out on loan, um, really trying to, you know, promote that campaign. So um, one of the questions that you asked, uh, was um, how are we participating in the opioid settlement fund? And um, you know, I, I, it's my understanding that some counties are actually allowing their coalitions to choose where the funding is going. That is not the case for Sacramento County. However, um, our county has decision makers that are evaluating recommendations. So um, our county uh, uh, substance use prevention and treatment department has actually presented to the Public Health Advisory Committee the Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board, and have asked us as the coalition to do a community survey. And we're actually providing the technical support to the county by creating and distributing the survey uh, through our coalition and all of our partners to gather insight on where our funds can be spent. And the county will be making their decisions based on all of this you know, collective feedback. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Department presented to those advisory committees, and they did that before we actually released the survey. And we did that because we knew we would get more ideas from these, these committees um, and gather additional proposals. Um, the survey actually just closed a couple of days ago, um, and we've had nearly 300 participants. And participants were asked to choose their top 10, not ranked, just overall top 10 preferences on the proposals that we received um, from the county. And we only used proposals that had an entity attached to them. So it couldn't just be, you know, this grand idea with nobody actually doing the work, had to have it, had to have an entity. 
And um, we had four categories. One was prevention, and um, the coalition was actually included in that, so hopefully we'll get some funding. Um, social media campaigns, education awareness proposals, and, and many of these entities actually focused on youth and communities of color. Uh, the second category was harm reduction, and we had a couple of proposals from that, but what was really important is that you know, harm reduction services can't be funded by the federal government. And currently, for any of our harm reduction entities, they weren't receiving any county funding. Um, and they actually scored the highest, which was nice to see. Um, we, our, our third category was uh, treatment linkage and medication-assisted treatment idea. And then we had an other, which included um, things like transportation to treatment and uh, sober living and residencies. And um, we actually did allow for a write-in answer, and we're still sifting through um, 200 answers <laughs> for that. And there actually might be more ideas uh, that really have merit. Um, so, you know, I, I think this is why opioid coalition should be involved in, in this process is, you know, we're connected to all of these wonderful entities within our community. And, you know, um, some of the, the agencies in charge of distributing these funds may not be aware of some of the great work that's being done in our community. Uh, we were personally very surprised by the will of the community in this survey. Um, didn't exactly go the way I thought that it would, and that's a good thing to note. Um, you know, and again, though, the county is still going to make the ultimate decision. This was just a way to guide them in the process. Great. That's wonderful, Lindsay. Um, and I think something that Kim said that, that the, both I, I know and across the coalitions, the amount of trust that is, has been built through these coalitions allows this sort of thing, a community process. And you're going to synthesize it. It doesn't mean that, that, that the county has to go through every single thing. That's a, that's a, a wonderful thing to, that you're going to be, uh, a benefit you're going to be bringing to this process. Um, Thank you so much, and and uh, I don't know if we'll have time for questions right now, but I think you can see just the the tremendous um, uh, wealth of of partnerships and the. Uh, work that has gone in. These are sophisticated coalitions that have looked at local data, are very aware of the evidence-based strategies, have done strategic planning around this, building the partnerships, even have structures for decision-making, very focused on equity, and they line up with what is the uh, uh, Schedule E and the, the, the allowable um, use of these funds. Great resource for you. Thank you, Amy. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. That was uh, excellent. Really appreciate that. Um, so um, I'm just going to take one minute to introduce the tool that will, in the next half hour, for those who stay on, we'll walk through in more detail. Um, someone could enable my screen share. Then I will just quickly go through that for folks, and then we'll do some. Thank you. Then we'll do some. Um, um, Q &A. So uh, just looking at the tool here, I'm hoping everyone can see it. If someone in the chat or my team can just confirm, but I'll keep going. Um, so what we have here is the readiness tool. So if you look at the handouts, thank you, Veronica. So if you look at the handouts tab, you have slides from today and you also have um, a link to download this tool. Again, this is something we created for you all based off of the uh, principles and guidance that we talked about earlier. The first part is really all around helping you develop a coordinated and transparent process. So we have a checklist here for considerations and things to incorporate into that process, like looking at your local data and involving coalitions and health departments and others who have that data to help inform how you'll prioritize your strategy, and how to develop a, prince, a vision and purpose around your funds, um, building partnerships, thinking about your decision-making structure, and then that equity piece of conducting an equity check. So we have a whole checklist here for you um, as part of your planning process. The second part goes to that wheel um, of partners. And so we have all of the key partners um, that we think are really instrumental that Lindsay um, and Kim have talked about have been engaged in their community. So for each partner, starting with behavioral health, a checkbox of whether you've already engaged them, 
Um, th these are fillable fields, so you can use this tool to kind of type in your responses um, and then share this internally. Um, but we have a place for you to note for each partner from the wheel which organizations or individuals are already part of your process and which ones you might need to engage. And then this is where we have links for where you can get started if you're looking for contacts, programs um, in your community, including here our link to all of the local overdose coalitions. So that continues with the list of partners that are really essential to the multi-sector approach. And then here at the end, we have part three around helping you prioritize, prioritize your strategies. So, we have each of the high impact abatement activities listed, and then a section for your planning process to think about on the justification of need for that particular activity in your community, what's already being done and what your next steps would be um, around that strategy. And then as I mentioned in the addendum, we have links to all of the projects and programs in California that you might um, want us to, to link up to that align with the high impact abatement activities. So these are all links to the different projects and programs happening across the state um, with some descriptions of them um, and counties that are currently engaged in programs. So with that, I will stop my sharing. I will pass it back over to Chelsea um, for the remaining few minutes before we go into a deeper dive on the tool. Thank you so much, Amy, for that review of the tool. And um, we're just going to put up the, the slides uh, once more. We're going to go into some uh, Q&A time now. Um, we are um, scheduled to end this portion of the presentation around 1.30, but we'll be continuing on with a little bit more of a deep dive into that tool and some additional discussion. So I encourage everyone to stick around for that. Um, we didn't have too many questions come into the chat, but I did want to just highlight one question that came in from Kelly Cabello, and she asks if there is a place on the DHCF website that lists the evidence-based studies that can be used to guide funding decisions. So um, I can send a link to the DHCF opioid settlement webpage and some of the resources that are housed there, but I wonder, Amy, um, or others, if there are resources that you would recommend for um, cities and counties to learn more about some of the evidence-based strategies for opioid use disorder. That's a great question. So I certainly encourage you to take a look at this tool because this tool links to all of the evidence-based projects and programs happening across the state of California. Um, so I think this is a really, really great starting place. Um, there is um, a, another um, guide that um, I encourage folks to take a look at. It's also from the John Hopkins School of Public Health that did those guiding principles. And they put together a whole document of evidence-based projects um, and programs that they recommend for stewards of local opioid settlement funds. So that's another source. Um, and then finally, always check out our website, copen.org. We have a pretty extensive resource library. Um, and you can always reach out to us, get on our mailing list, and we can be a resource to you all as you're kind of thinking about your prioritization of activities, processes, um, and anything to kind of support your, your work going forward. Great. Um, another question that came in was about, uh, was actually specifically for Lindsay on the Sacramento Coalition's work. Um, Lydia Casa Burdick is wondering if you can share the survey that was sent to the community with uh, folks on the webinar. So the survey it was actually very specific to proposals that we had. Um, so I don't, I don't think sharing it would necessarily do you any good, but the, the way that we structured it was the name of the organization that was requesting funding, what their program was, um, you know, a name of their program, and then just a little description. And we had 25 to choose from. And um, more are basically going to be coming in based on the other answer. Um, so it, it really needs to be gathered from your community to vote on. Wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay. And um, if, if it would be helpful, perhaps even just the link to see kind of the options that Sacramento has, has shared um, may be helpful. But it's, it's good even just to know that surveys and things like that are, are probably a useful tool for some of the 
cities and counties to consider as they kind of narrow in on all of the many proposals that they have received. Um, some other questions um, that I'm hoping to, to hear a little bit about. Um, so I know that some of the communities in California have received really large sums of money. They've, you know, receiving millions in a given year. There are other um, cities and counties who have signed on to these settlements who may be receiving much lower amounts of funding. So I'm curious, Amy and others, if, um, if you have any thoughts about that, is it still worthwhile to go through this kind of uh, community planning process when, um, you know, cities and counties are receiving you know, smaller amounts of funds, um, you know, and which, of course, add up over time and they can kind of build up over time as well. But um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I, I would say yes. Um, and, um, you know, given the fact that there is going to be more funding, as you said, that's going to be coming down the line for years and years to come, having a strategy in place particularly with the recommendation of having a pool for other funds that might come in from other sources outside of the settlements, having a local strategy in place and thinking about priorities um, and a decision-making process and structure, um, even before the money comes in is always a key recommendation that, that we have. Mary, anything you wanna add on that? Oh, you're on mute. We see this disparity in resources available also in, among coalition members, and I think it's part of the strength of coalitions, and particularly that coalitions are connected with one another. So when there are scarce uh, resources or less funding available, I think some of that funding for the actual work of connecting uh, the, the, the uh, entities and the resources that are focused on those allowable activities is important and that they can participate in something like the California Overdose Prevention Network. Because what we've seen over and over again is one coalition will develop the resource, they'll share it. It can, it, it, they can leverage that. So with few resources, they're leveraging um, uh, uh, innovations that have been used in another area, resources, sharing. Um, uh, a good example is there's a wonderful Let's Talk uh, document that was, it's for parents in high school and junior high. Let's begin to talk as junior high, let's talk as high school. That has been shared. It was started in Marin County, that sort of thing. Um, so I think when you have scarce resources, be very strategic about how you use them. And by all means, use this hub that is the coalition in a community. That's terrific, and uh, thank you, Mary. And I know we shared the link to the COPEN website and all of the coalitions there. So um, hopefully some great tools and resources folks can look to as well. Um, so I know we are at the end of our hour for the first part of this presentation. Um, so I wanna thank uh, Mary and Lindsay um, and Kim for their, um, uh, you know, sharing with us and, and learning more about what's going on in their communities. It's been tremendously valuable. Um, as uh, then we go into the next part of the session, I wanna turn it over to Amy to walk through kind of the needs assessment tool that they have put together um, that can kind of help cities and counties to um, walk through this process and kind of take an inventory of what you may have in your jurisdiction and some of the stakeholders um, that you should be considering, um, you know, bringing to the table. Thank you. Oh, and looks like for folks um, still on the line, Lindsay, put that survey monkey. Um, if we want to share that for those who are interested in just seeing their survey, just as an example. So we'll put that out for folks who want to take a look at that. And again, always please reach out to us at copen at healthleadership.org. Um, we have a whole host of tools, resources, examples. We can make connections for you for your local coalition. So please um, see us as a resource for that. Um, so I will share my screen again. Okay. Um, so here is that opioid settlement fund, fund readiness tool. Um, and um, the idea, you know, with the work that we do through the uh, California Overdose Prevention Network is we support learning communities. We find it incredibly valuable, or at least our participants find it incredibly valuable to be able to learn from one another. And we know you all are dispersed across the state and might be curious to see um, what others are doing or thinking um, in terms of their process. So what we'll do is we'll go through this tool um, again um, and then give you an opportunity to put um, into the question box 
um, some of your responses for how you would answer these questions at this point um, in the process. Again, this can just be a starting point and kind of launching pad um, wherever you are in your process. Um, but we'll have you ent 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 uh, enter some of your responses um, into the question box and then Chelsea will read them aloud and then hopefully you can kind of hear from one another and, and get some new ideas. So again, this first part of the tool is to help you develop a coordinated and transparent process. These funds will be coming in for 18 years at least, um, and it's really important to have that process in place. Even if it's a limited amount of funding, it could be pooled together with funding, other funding sources you might have. So um, I'm going to give everyone a minute to think about it, um, but if you could put into the question box an answer to one of these parts of our, our checklist here. So for example, if you've reviewed some local data and use that to help prioritize where you might want to invest your funds, share that with us. What data have you looked at and how have you used that towards this first checkbox of prioritizing a particular population or region within your community? If you've done some work around establishing vision and purpose within your community, what does that look like? Or what is your vision and purpose around how these funds will be used? If you started to build partnerships, what does that look like? Um, hopefully some of you have started to think about a structure for how decisions are made for the funds. Um, we talked about the survey in Sacramento um, and how that, those uh, decisions will be communicated. So if you have anything to share, or questions, but anything to share of what that's looked like for you so far. And then the last thing is around this equity check. Um, so have you done work in your community to think about a process to ensure that the allocation of funds support organizations, communities that serve those most impacted by the addiction and overdose, like those who directly engage with people with lived and living experience, people who use drugs, and people who represent communities of color like Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. So I will be silent for a minute and appreciate you all putting some thoughts and where you are in this process for any of these, you could just pick one um, into the, to the question box and then Chelsea will read it aloud. Currently, no uh, responses are coming in. People are maybe feeling a little bit shy. Um, <laughs> but I'll say I'll just put a plug for that um, local data with the CDPH dashboard. I find it's a really terrific resource uh, for cities and counties. You can um, go all the way down to the um, county or zip code level to kind of look at where overdoses are happening in your community, identify other um, you know, drug concerns in your community beyond opioids. Um, you can fentanyl from so um, some really great resources there that I encourage you to use. Um, and now we do have one, actually, another um, piece of feedback. So uh, Lydia Kazaber says, we used uh, the body of another existing coalition. We joined public health and protection our local county overdose data. CDC analysts presented the county-specific data OD map, which is one of the resources that Amy mentioned there. And they also completed a gap of their continuum of care, prevention, early intervention, to res residential treatment at availability. Um, they're going to continue the gap analysis of the remainder of county services and hoping that will guide their next conversation regarding the gaps that they've identified. That's and then Melissa. Oh, sorry, I was going to read. Uh, Melissa Shaw says that they've identified seven strategies or areas to focus their opioid funding on and they are building up partnership with the local Office of Education. Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, thank you for those. Those are some great examples and, and good to see how that's already happening on the ground. And again, yes, OD map. Um, we have it listed here in the tool and we have some links of how you can get connected to those using OD map, but it is a 
uh, data hotspotting tool that first responders and public health departments um, can utilize to help identify within geographically on a map where overdoses are spiking. Um, and that can be a really, really helpful planning and prioritization tool in terms of how funds are spent um, and where they're prioritized within your region. Right, so I will now skip down to part two, um, which is this big piece um, that we really emphasize um, a lot in our work around um, partnerships. Okay, so um, it's critical to know, as we talked about, what's already taking place in your community. Um, and that way you can expand and sustain existing programs instead of reinventing the wheel. Um, and as I talked about this all hands on deck approach is really necessary for such a complex crisis. So we know you might not be able to engage all of these partners, but we would love um, for a couple folks to share um, which partners have you already engaged? Um, organizations, individuals, what does that look like? And then which ones coming out of today would you like to prioritize? to have a conversation with or build a partnership with, or do you think is really important to be part of the conversation around opioid settlement funds in your community? So looking at this wheel, which partners have you engaged? And if you could mention either just the partner or organizations that you've engaged already around this process, and then which ones do you want to engage going forward in terms of your opioid settlement funding? Give folks another minute here. While we're waiting on that, um, there was another response that came in from the last question from Nicole Ibrahimi Noichin. And Nicole says, we have sent out a survey to our stakeholders, local opioid coalition members, education, public health, social services, law enforcement, healthcare, et cetera, to ask for priorities for populations as well as activities, treatment, training, prevention, and education for the use of settlement funds. And we are now in the process of sending out applications. So um, thank you for sharing that example, Nicole. And if you have a copy of that survey, I'm sure folks would love to see some of the questions that were asked there. Um, and then another um, response from Kristen Thompson is that, um, Kristen says it's been very helpful and she uh, works with the fire department EMS division and will be spearheading the efforts in their city. Um, figuring out how to spend the funds um, has been a little challenging for them, um, especially um, in terms of uh, care of opioid overdoses before the hospital setting um, beyond supplying Narcan. So um, she's looking forward to future webinars or more information that can be shared about that. Just one thing on that, along those lines, in terms of EMS, one thing to think about is we are seeing, uh, I mean, EMS is doing such incredible work in community paramedicine, and this is an area where there's a lot of great opportunity. One thing we are seeing increasingly is the uh, beginning initiating um, medication assisted treatment, buprenorphine in the field, and linking the linkages. We've got Eat, um, the bridge program in California links emergency rooms to um, with people coming in to treatment. Then it's like no wrong door and creating a system. And so I think there will be opportunities with this funding to think about how you build these systems uh, uh, for um, preventing overdoses and connecting to treatment. I think that's a really great point, Mary. And I think another one to always emphasize, of course, and it goes back to those principles that we talked about in the beginning um, around primary prevention. So thinking about before addiction, thinking about um, youth and youth engagement, youth education, we have some really great examples and resources um, of programs and curricula that our coalitions have helped develop um, and are a really um, helpful way to start thinking upstream um, as we say in public health, before um, addiction substance use starts. Do 
Okay, Chelsea, I'm having a hard time with this the toggling here. Anything else that's come in? I can move on. Sorry about that. Um, yes, there's one more response. Um, Lee Miller says um, CMC's recovery program was initially built from grant funds through an MHSA initiative and Prop 47, partnering with local ED, court, county, and local coalitions. Um, they'd like to look at um, funding to help continue support that work. So I think kind of tying in with some of the things you mentioned earlier, Amy, about um, tying in with efforts that maybe are uh, funded through other uh, county funding streams that you may have, um, may relate to other behavioral health grants that um, you have. So really kind of using the settlement funds to supplement things that you already have going on in your community, um, supplementing rather than supplanting or replacing funds really to kind of help grow those programs. Absolutely. And really enhancing, yeah, exactly what already exists. And as Mary was saying, helping create those systems of care. And I think this is an incredible opportunity for those conversations to happen. I mean, the, the, the funds are just kind of one avenue to kind of stimulate and spark some new opportunities to really expand the reach and breadth and impact of the work that's already taking place across California and within your communities. Thank you. Okay, and then I will move on to this third part of the tool. Um, and again, the you know the purpose of the, the role that DHCS is playing is really structuring these funds to ensure that participating jurisdictions invest in evidence-based strategies that will yield a high impact. And I will say for the earlier question, we do have a link here in this tool to a resource to look up some of those evidence-based strategies. Um, and the fact that California has its own list of high impact abatement activities um, that participating subdivisions need to spend no less than 50% on is a really great way to kind of prioritize um, the most um, important ways and impactful ways uh, to save lives. So looking at this section of the tool again, we have um, each of the six high impact abatement activities here in California. And we have um, a column for each of them for you to put in the justification of need for that activity within your community. So why do you think that that's really important to invest in? What work is already being done and what next steps are needed? So again, we'll give us a minute. I hope that we can get one or two folks to share for any of these high impact activities, abatement activities. How have you demonstrated or determined or how will you determine justification of need for that activity? What work do you know is already being done and what do you see as some of your, your next steps? You could just focus on one of those pieces, like the next steps, for example. But if you were to look at these six high impact abatement activities, what do you think needs to happen as a next step to allocate funds around that area? So I think we're waiting for more responses to come in, but I'll just say I know that DHCS added that sixth um, high impact abatement area um, as a result of kind of some feedback on one of these webinars that um, I think 90% of the subdivisions who were present um, were in support of having the lock zone as one of those high impact abatement activities. Um, and I think uh, from what I've seen, it, some, some cities that maybe are receiving a smaller amount of funds, this can be a good way to you know, meet that requirement and also get more naloxone out to the community. So just wanted to add that. I don't think we have any additional um, feedback yet. Um, Amy, if you want to continue on and we can see if there's anything else that comes up in the chat. Okay, great. Well, yes, yeah, so be, um, I encourage folks to share um, and again, reach out to us if you have any questions about this tool, how to utilize it, um, how to engage your local coalition. We're happy to support. Um, again, here at the end, we have this addendum within the tool of California state opioid response programs with links um, and how they connect to the different high impact abatement activities. So hopefully that's a useful resource for you all as well. Um, and that is it on our end. Um, so we um, really appreciate um, being welcomed for today's conversation and to be able to share the tool. 
with you all um, and for you all engaging um, in today's presentation. So thank you so much. And um, go to copen.org to sign up for our digest. Um, and you can reach out to us at copen at healthleadership.org. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you uh, to the coalition leads as well for joining us for this. Um, as I mentioned earlier on the webinar, the uh, presentation materials are all available on the handout tab on your GoToWebinar control panel, so you can access them there. Um, and we will also be posting the materials on the DHCS Opioid Settlement webpage. Uh, they should be posted by afternoon tomorrow um, if you want to access them there. Um, and we will be sending out more of these uh, technical assistance webinars. Please do let us know if there are other topics that you'd like to see addressed or questions that you have. They can be sent to OSF at dhcs.ca.gov. Um, with that, um, I want to thank everyone for joining and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everyone.